On Christmas Eve 1968, the world anxiously awaited news from Apollo. For 35 minutes, NASA heard only static, while the spacecraft was behind the moon and out of contact. Exactly on schedule, the spacecraft rounded the moon's edge and came into radio contact. The astronauts now saw one of the most stirring sights in the human experience, the Earth slowly rising above the rim of the moon. Earthrise was remarkable. Uh, we were so engrossed with the moon itself and with our mission there. Uh, but when it came up over the, uh, over the lunar horizon, that was a sight that I think set us all back. That was remarkable. Oh yeah, absolutely. No question about it. I, I think that sight of the Earthrise the horizon of the moon has got to be one of the most thrilling television pictures we've ever seen or will ever see. I can't imagine anything ever matching that. And if there is a red-blooded American boy or girl who didn't want to go to the moon to see that personally, I'd, I'd be surprised. In the distance of the Apollo flights, uh, when you look at the, uh, the Earth, it looks completely uninhabited. But you know there's about five billion astronauts down there all striving for the same thing, living on a spacecraft called Earth. Except for those three guys aboard Apollo 8, Borman, Lovell, and Anders, except for those three guys, every single human being who existed or had ever existed was on that object, that little fragile hemisphere that they were seeing rise up above the lunar surface. They were looking back at their home world and seeing it and the celestial dance as, uh, as planets rise and moons move. They were seeing that choreography of the heavens in a way that no one had ever seen it before. And it was just breathtaking. While Apollo 8 orbited the moon, the crew took photographs, measured gravitational shifts, and scouted for future landing sites. As they passed over the unclaimed mountains, Jim Lovell spotted what he'd been looking for. Fulfilling a secret tribute to his wife, he named one of the peaks Mount Marilyn. Bill Landers was naming everything uh, for the flight, especially the back side, the far side, uh, the near side. And I said, Bill, what's, have you got a name for that mountain? And no, and no. And so I figured that as an explorer, we had the privilege of naming something that hadn't been named before. Uh, and so Mount Maryland stuck with the crews. Apollo 11 used it as an initial point for their, their landing to go into the Sea of Tranquility. But the, this International Astronomical Union of uh, guys that uh, must be of ancient age of some sort, uh, only want to name things on the moon, uh, you know, of, of people back in the 14th century, I think. Although they did very nicely name three craters on the far side of the moon for Anders, Borman, and Lovell. Of course, we never can see them from the near side, but they're there. As the Christmas Eve mission neared its end, the crew of Apollo 8 delivered one final message to the people of Earth. We are now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on this good earth.
As Apollo 8 circled around the back of the moon on her 10th and final orbit, there was one critical task left to perform. Her main engine would have to fire properly and on time. If not, three dead astronauts would be locked forever in an endless freefall around the lifeless moon. engine performed just as intended. Valves opened, fuels exploded. Apollo 8 was coming home. Well, there was sure a lot of uh, relief on our part when <laughs> it went off to uh, hypergolic and all these good things. You know, you can have leaks, this and that and the other thing. And they, they had tested that engine ad infinitum at Arnold uh, Air Force Base in, in Tullahoma, Tennessee. And uh, again, you know, the people that were working on it were the best. Uh, and uh, I had every confidence it was going to work, but boy, was I glad when it did. I told Michael, you guys are up there, and uh, he said, who's driving? That's a good question. I think Isaac Newton's doing most of the driving right now. I think I must have the feeling that the travelers in the old sailing ships used to have. You're going on a very long voyage away from home, and uh, now we're headed back. And uh, I have that feeling of being proud of the trip, but still, uh, still happy to be going back home and back to our home port. As Apollo 8 headed for Earth, Mission Control thought it would be a nice moment to read the crew some of the thousands of telegrams they'd received. One of their favorites evoked the spirit of the first American rocket pioneer. It read, Congratulations, you have turned into reality the dreams of Robert Goddard. Signed, Charles and Ann Morrow Lindbergh. During the flight itself, uh, we were so involved in making sure that things went right and that we did the right things to make, to make this a successful flight that we that the importance of the achievement, I don't think, was, was evident to us at the time. It wasn't until after we landed and digested it and listened to uh, the accolades of the people and uh, spent some time uh, thinking about it that we realized really what had been accomplished. You know, there was that great story when, uh, when Borman and his crew got back from Apollo 8, you know, and brought with them probably the most extraordinary photograph of the 20th century uh, of the uh, Earthrise. Uh, and that picture got published, and um, somebody sent, somebody that Borman had never even met sent him a telegram that said, you saved 1968. 